this. We have this week and next week yet. And uh, man, I hate to think of stopping next week because I have so many other guys I want to teach <laughs> teach you about. But yeah. <laughs> Well, we're just really be praying as to what my next steps are. I mean, I right now I sort of have my road map as to what my next steps are. I just want to make sure that this is of the Lord. But we're talking about a an organization, we're going to call it Teachers of the Word, where we have various teachers that we can send out, whether it's to the mission field to teach, whether it's to small churches or medium-sized churches, uh, and talking with Jason. This afternoon, since uh, he's doing, he likes apologetics. I said, you know, we could go out to a church. You take apologetics, and I'll take on how to study the Bible for yourself, or something like that. And it'd just be good to go to some of these churches and these communities uh, where they never get exposed to in-depth Bible teaching. The question is, how do you market that? How do you really get to these churches? The people may want it, the pastors may not want you to come in, <laughs> so there's all kinds of things that hurdles will have to jump through or jump over. But it's, you just can't wait until we get started in that, and hopefully by September, in fact even the summer I expect uh, some things to happen, but then in September it's very possible that uh, we'll be having another men's Bible study, and most likely it will be at my house, though they've asked me to come back here and do some teaching. But I want to give the new pastor some wiggle room to get his own feet on the ground in that. So we'll see how that goes. All right, let's begin with prayer. Lord, we are, again, very grateful to you that you've given us a book that tells us about you. You've revealed yourself. You want us to know who you are. You want us to know about your love for us, the great sacrifice you made for us the giving of your Holy Spirit to empower and direct us and give us insight into truth. And we pray that he will be our instructor tonight. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, it took us five weeks to do go through Abraham, <clears throat> and we have two weeks for Moses. <laughs> and Abraham has this much of the book of Genesis, and Moses has five books. <laughs> so try to figure that one out. But I've divided Moses' life into three sections. But before we even talk about that, let's just start here with the first 40 years of his life. And the uh, notes that you have will give you some of that background. We're going from Abraham to Moses. To get to Moses, you have to go through Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and a few other people before we get down to the days of Moses. But Abraham and Moses do have a connection that we're going to see here in a few minutes. After Abraham comes Isaac and then Jacob. These men are known as the patriarchs, the fathers. The one son, Jacob, ends up having 12 sons. And the 11th son was named Joseph. And uh, because the father showed him favoritism, and the reason he showed him favoritism was that the woman he really loved, he had four wives, Jacob did. The woman he really loved, the one he wanted in the first place, was Rachel. But his father-in-law tricked him, and uh, when he got awake the next morning, he found that he was sleeping with Leah, not Rachel. And... His father-in-law, no, I mean not his father-in-law, his uncle. His uncle, Laban, and you, know, you may wonder today, how in the world could that happen? <laughs> well, in those days, just like in a lot of places today, with a veil over your face and everything else, you may think you were getting something and be disappointed after the veil is removed. And that's what happened, you know. He has Rachel's face in mind, and <laughs> next day he, he sees that he has Leah. So, ten children are born to Leah and, and, and the other handmaiden, and uh, actually the other two handmaidens, and then comes Rachel. Well, Rachel, when he marries Rachel after seven more years of working for his uncle, uh, she conceives and she bears him Joseph. 
So here is the son from the woman he really loves, not from the other three. And so he gives Joseph this beautiful robe. And Joseph is a 17-year-old is a when we are introduced to him. And like most 17-year-olds, is not really smart. And he has this great dream, and he tells his brothers this great dream, which makes his brothers even more angry at him because it implied they would bow down before Joseph somewhere along the line, this little runt. And then he has a second dream, and then he tells them that dream, and they hate him all the more, so finally they're fed up with Joseph, and there's a caravan going through their area, and they sell Joseph to the caravan. Goes down to Egypt, and he's sold to a man by the name of Potiphar. And while he is working for Potiphar, uh, he is thrown in prison uh, because he is convicted of trying to rape Potiphar's wife, which is not at all true. Actually, he ran away from her. And uh, so he's thrown in prison. And after he's in prison for a period of years, finally he is released because he is able to interpret dreams. And so the Pharaoh makes him second in command there in the kingdom of Egypt. He brings his family to Egypt, to a place called Goshen. And by the way, Goshen is a beautiful area. It's, it's a very fertile area of Egypt. Uh, oh, what's his name with Focus on the Family? has this whole series that the world may know. Ray yeah, Ray. He has a new series out on Egypt. I think there are one or two DVDs on Egypt. And he talks about Goshen and, and shows you how beautiful Goshen is. So they weren't, they weren't living in, in, in the bad section of Egypt. They were living in the great section of Egypt. Vanderlaan. Vander, Vanderlaan. Vanderlaan. Uh, boy, anything that he produces that you should get hold of. And you get all that through focus on the family. After Joseph's death, another king, to, king comes to power. And it says, who did not know about Joseph. And so these Hebrews are now beginning to multiply. And this new king, this pharaoh, becomes very, very concerned and meets with his advisors and he decides, let's enslave these Hebrews, make them work for us. Otherwise, they're going to continue to multiply. They'll be greater in number than we are and they, they will overtake us. So they're in slavery for 400 years. Now, I said at the beginning that there's a connection between Abraham and Moses, and here is the connection. Because remember when God is making the covenant with Abraham, and this deep sleep comes upon Abraham in Genesis chapter 15. And he is told to take these birds and these animals and slice them in half, and, and the blood runs down into his gully, and it says that this, this fire goes between the pieces through the blood. Well, God tells him this, that later on, your people will be enslaved for 400 years. And after that time, they will come back. And they will come out of slavery. And they will come out as wealthy people. And so here, as Moses comes on the scene, this part of the prophecy is being fulfilled. So the Hebrews are crying out to God, and God hears their cry. Now, usually when we seek the Lord and we really cry out to Him, we desire that He immediately answers us. In other words, we're in, pro in trouble, please get me out of that. But you'll find throughout life that God's timing and your timing are totally different. Usually completely opposite. There are times within, that you don't think you're ready, and all of a sudden he brings something your way, and you better get moving in that direction. And you think, well, I'm not prepared for this. And God says, you're prepared as much as you have to be, get moving. There are other times that you are so prepared, you so much want this new direction, you're ready to go, and it's like, God, come on, let's go, let's do it. 
and four more years down the road, <laughs> all of a sudden, after you go, and you're ready to go back to the farm, and all of a sudden that door opens up. And you think, how does that work? Well, God has his own timing for his own reasons. So the Hebrews cry out to God. God hears them. So you would think God would immediately send a man as they are crying out to him. But recognize, as he begins to prepare a deliverer for them, <laughs> it takes 80 years before the deliverer shows up. Think about that. So whatever it is that you want to see God respond to almost immediately, remember for Abraham, the promise is given at age 75, the promise is fulfilled at age 100. And you see that again and again in Scripture. And here, God makes a promise, a prophecy to Abraham that his people will be enslaved Many hundreds of years pass before they are enslaved. And then he says they will come out and the people cry out to God. God begins to respond by pre preparing a deliverer. But God is not using the miracle at this point. He has this whole bag of miracles. But rather than dip into his bag of miracles and all of a sudden Moses shows up. No, that's not what he's doing. He dips into the bag of the ordinary. And here are all kinds of things that are very ordinary. And he says, I will dip into the bag of the ordinary. And I'm going to birth a child here. And this child will grow up in the usual way. And then he will deliver Israel. So there are times God will dip into his bag of miracles. Other times he dips into his bag of the ordinary. And I would say most of the time it's in the bag of the ordinary, which means he uses natural law. He uses natural process. He uses natural timing. Rather than jumping in and intervening, you pray, he answers your prayer, but he uses the natural process. So when you and I are convinced that he hasn't even heard us, so we continue to pray and pray and pray and beg and plead and everything else, he is basically saying, it's there, it's there, it's coming. But I'm going to use the natural process in order for this to happen. And so as they are crying out, he brings a little boy into the world. He makes certain that this young boy would grow up well-educated in the Egyptian culture, knowing the Egyptian language and having the Egyptian wisdom and knowledge. That's the kind of person he wants to use as a deliverer. Not some outsider, but an insider. A man who knows how the pharaohs think. A man who understands pharaoh's court. A man who knows what goes on on the inside and when the doors are closed and the discussions that take place. Well, how do you get that to happen? Well, you start with a seed. <laughs> and then that seed begins to grow. And we are told Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and he was powerful in speech and action. Now keep that verse in mind because Moses contradicts that verse, by the way. Okay? As an excuse. Okay. For the first 40 years of his life, Moses not only had the advantages uh, over that his own race did not possess. I mean, the Hebrews didn't have the advantages that Moses had because Moses is brought up into the court of Pharaoh. Moses is brought up uh, under Pharaoh's daughter. And so as Moses' mother hides him there among the reeds, Pharaoh's daughter comes out again a natural process. It's time to take a bath. She comes out to take a bath. And all of a sudden she hears this little baby crying. She looks at this little baby, cute little baby. She takes it and decides this is the child I will keep. 
And of course, they realize this is a Hebrew child, but who cares if it's a Hebrew child? Even though, even though there is an edict by the Pharaoh for all the midwives to kill all the males that were born. It sounds like Herod many, many years later. Here is a Hebrew child that is spared because it's my daughter. <laughs> my daughter wanted to have a child. Now my daughter has a child. And in this whole process, again, looking at God's beautiful timing and the way he works things out, there's a little girl watching what is going on. And she's hiding in the reeds. And she sees Pharaoh's daughter come and lift out the baby. So this little girl named Miriam, who happens to be Moses' sister, makes her appearance. And when Pharaoh's daughter sees this little girl, she says, would you go and find some Hebrew mother that would be able to nurse this child because the Pharaoh's daughter couldn't nurse the child. Guess who she gets? <laughs> she gets Moses' mom. So here, Moses' mother is able to nurse this child and, and spend all these years with this child. And then this child is reared there by Pharaoh's daughter in Pharaoh's court. It was when he was in his prime, though, that Moses sees an Egyptian beating up a Hebrew man. And so Moses looks this way and he looks that way, and he thinks the coast is clear. And he decides to intervene, and he kills the Egyptian and buries him. What happens? Well, this becomes public knowledge, and Moses has to flee for his life. All that is there in chapter 2. So he flees. And we are told in verse uh, 16, Now a priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and fill the trowels to water their father's flock. Some shepherds came along and, and drove them away, but Moses got up and came to the rescue and watered their flock. And of course, one of those girls was a very attractive girl, and uh, she brings Moses home, and Moses ends up marrying this woman, Zipporah. And she is the daughter of the priest of Midian. So he goes to Midian. The big question is, why Midian? And I come up with a number of reasons. The first reason is that it was an area far away from Egypt. It was way on the other side of the Sinai Peninsula. So it was far from Egypt, and the Egyptians were not in control. Secondly, the Midianites were actually descendants of Abraham, who was the first Hebrew. Thirdly, Moses was fleeing to his own people. So they were like distant kissing cousins, okay? So he is now among his own people. He identified with the Egyptians, even though he was Hebrew. And now as he flees for his life, he goes back, goes not back to, he was never there before. He goes to his own people. Now that's the historical background of everything up to this point of Moses' first 40 years. However, when he arrived in Midian, realized he was dressed as an Egyptian, he talked like an Egyptian, he had Egyptian garb. So I imagine that these uh, daughters were wondering, are we getting arrested or what world is going on here? This character who comes to us, this Egyptian who comes to us. So here we are, Egypt, and the land of Midian is way over there. So you see the great distance between the two. So he felt that he would be safe there in the land of Midian. Okay, before we go on, any questions as far as that background is concerned? Because I want you to realize that he is now far away and he feels safe, he feels secure, but no longer is he a prince of Egypt. 
because his entire occupation is going to change. His entire identity is going to change. He's no longer this fair-haired boy. He's no longer this man who has great authority over thousands of people. That Glenn. was interesting. I didn't realize that the Lent, the Midian people there were his relatives. Yeah. Did they know he was there? <laughs> that I don't know. I imagine when he began to share with them, he would mention that, you know, he's, his parents were from the tribe of Levi, and Down. Jethro, Levi, Levi, well, that's one of the sons of Jacob, and Jacob was, one, was Isaac's son, and Isaac was Abraham's son. Abraham yeah. is also our father, only it was through another line. And so the Midianites, yeah. So they have that relationship. And what you find throughout the Old Testament is when you have these various nations, other than the Philistines, when you have the Moabites and you have the Ammonites and, and you have the Edomites, all these are cousins. Okay. I mean, all related to one another. And so it's, it's like... The Hatfields and the McCoys that are constantly fighting each other because you have these, these uh, blood relationships. That whole area uh, basically comes out through Abraham. Moses eventually met and married Zipporah, the daughter of the priest of Midian, and he was now preparing to enter the next 40 years. Not as a prince, not as an Egyptian, but now basically as a Midianite, because now he is identifying with the Midianites. Now eventually the Midianites and the Israelites fight one another, but not at this stage, all right? So when you look at these passages of scripture, uh, here in chapter 2, and, and you realize all this has taken place. We've gone from the first 40 years of his life right up to chapter 3 and verse 1. So all that time, you don't have a whole lot in his first 40 years. <laughs> Other than you know that he was in the fast lane. He had wealth, he had power, he had name recognition. He had just about anything you would want, he could get. He could make decisions on his own. You look at him and you say, boy, those were the glory days. They were the good old days. And I wonder how many times as Moses is out there taking care of the sheep, he looked back and thought, why did I do that? How could I have gotten myself in this situation? Now the mighty have fallen. Man, life is over. And I'm only 40. I have many years ahead of me. But I have no future. When, when he transfers from the first 40 years to the next 40 years, he is in a desert experience. As I thought about that, some thoughts came to my mind. Think about the first 40 years of your life now. Most of you are, I think most of you, a number of you, haven't even reached 40. So it's not too hard for you to think of the first 40 years of your life. <laughs> The rest of us look back on those first 40 years. And we have something to compare. We have a way to evaluate where we are today compared to where we were in the first 40 years. And as I thought through individuals who've gone through that first 40 years, uh, here are some observations I've made. Some are in their early prime. It's a time that they're just beginning to find their stride. 
They're not in their prime yet. Their prime might be at 42, 45, 46, and at that stage, man, they are just all power, and they, they are almost like Moses in the first 40 years. I mean, that's when the career is going and, 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 and the kids are in school and, and all kinds of things, great things are happening and they're in control of their lives and they think, and they're making good money and they think, man, this is how life is. You know, I'm not going to be like a bunch of those other flunkies, you know, who do something and then they drop out. Man, I, I'm going to stay in this. This, is a, this, is a, this feels good. This is, this is the time when, when people know who I am. Others, is this it? They still have not found themselves or thought they have and then discover a whole new direction in the next 40 years. And I have a couple of names up here. Uh, my son Rick, first 40 years, pastor uh, in Indiana, growing church. All kinds of great things happening in his life. And uh, around 42, no, around 39 or 40 is when all of a sudden his life totally changed. And now he's in a totally different kind of a career. I think of Steve, who many times I look back and say, God, what do you have for him? <laughs> I mean, there's a lot in there, but I have no idea what direction he's going to go. And he's working on staff here. And uh, it was, what, two years ago, three years ago, all of a sudden that totally changed. And now what he is doing is something he said he would never do, something he never even thought of doing, something he had run away from for a long time, something he would not even want to think about. And now in his second 40 years, he is going a totally different direction and as happy as a lark. Jason. Just turned 40 last month. First 40 years, you could say these were the glory days, name recognition, fame, fortune, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, now he's getting ready for, Lord, what is it? And uh, while well, he's getting his master's degree in apologetics, he's uh, you know, taking classes, he's going out and speaking different places, so he's just starting to lay the foundation for whatever God has for him. Uh, did I just, what happened there? It went away. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Let's see, see what previous is. All right, come on. Well, not only did it go away, <laughs> It just stopped. All right, come here. Let's get back. Yep, that's not what I want. Okay. I will manhandle it. <laughs> Boink. Previous. Previous. Come on, previous. Previous. You don't want to do that, do you? All right, let's go up this way. All right. Okay. Some other names. Tom. Are you, you are 40 now? Are you 40? Almost 39. 39. All right. You're still in your first 40 years. But Tom was like Jason. You know, that's the period of time where you have the name recognition, the glory, the fame, etc. And still in football, only doing something totally different. And who knows? I, th I am convinced that he's coming into the best years of his life right now, just as Jason is. Matt Lepsis was another Bronco. And uh, Matt's first 40 years, is he your age or is he? Younger. Oh, he is younger. So he's still in his first 40 years. But in those first 40 years, he had all the fame and fortune and everything else and then all of a sudden God gets hold of him and what's he doing now? Dallas Seminary, second year student studying Greek and Hebrew and going to preaching classes which scared the daylights out of him and uh, he just can't wait to keep on studying and then get out and say alright Lord now what do you have? So these first 40 years 
are sort of foundational for what God has for you in the future. Spiritual enrichment. For others, it's the time of new insights into the scriptures and new insights into the reality of God. I really got geared into the Lord at the age of 19. And so my first 40 years were, all right, now, since God calls me into the ministry, I better know something about the Bible. So I go to college and I go to seminary, preparation, etc. And uh, was a Christian head director for three years in Minneapolis. And then my first senior pastor was in, up in uh, Winnipeg, Canada. And then my second senior pastor was in Fresno, California. And it was during that time when I turned 40. So that period of my life was basically preparation and gaining some experience for what God really had for me later on. Family focus. Many at this stage have children in grade school, middle school, high school, and our college. And so this can be a great family time because you go from single to married and then all of a sudden you have this multitude out there and you start learning how to be a parent. You know, you get no training on how to be a parent. But after the kids leave, now you got your PhD in parenting. Uh, known as grandfather and grandmother. And then all of a sudden the grandchildren come and it's like, uh, boy, why didn't you treat me like that? Career focus. Others are completely given over to their careers and miss great opportunities with their families. So the first 40 years or 45 years may go by and the career is there and and the prestige and the authority and all and the money and all these other wonderful things. And then around the age of 55 or 60, you look back and say, wow, I missed the boat. But we have a God of grace who's able to do some great things, even with that as a background. Entrenched. Then there are those who are entrenched. <laughs> Whether they are in the first 40 years, they are in the next 40 years. And if God gave them many more years, they would be in the next 40 years. They haven't changed. Uh, I can go back to Pennsylvania, and maybe it's more like out on the East Coast, but I go back to Pennsylvania, and I see some of the guys I went to school with, and they're the same. I mean, they had certain jobs that that's what they did all their life, and, and now they're retired, but... They're the same. There, there hasn't been any real development or any real growth in their lives other than the aging process. God's perspective, from the Lord's view, it's a time of preparation for the next 40 years, more or less, of your life. It's sort of laying the foundation There's those first 40 years. So if you are under the age of 40, you are still laying the foundation for some great things that God has for you as you continue to walk with Him. You know, a lot of times we look back and uh, at those earlier years and think they were the best times of our life. But when you look back and, and you look at what you can become in the process, the future will be your best years. Moses was in his early prime. He had the name recognition, wealth, power, education, everything you could want. He was even a possible successor to the throne. However, he was just getting ready to enter what I call God's waiting room. And he was unaware of it. You know, the other day I went out and bought, since I have hundreds of VHS tapes, it's like, I mean, heavy boxes of VHS tapes. <laughs> it's like, what are you going to do with that stuff? Well, you know, you don't want to throw it out because it's family and it's early preaching and, and other things. 
So I went, stopped at Best Buy about two weeks ago and I said, do you have any kind of machine that you can stick that VHS in and comes out the DVD? <laughs> and he says, yeah. And he showed me two of them, so I got one of them. And so what I do is get up in the morning before breakfast, stick tape in, put a DVD in, walk away from it, and about an hour or so later, you know, they're ready to pull out. So as I was looking over some things, there are things I did I had totally forgotten. There are people I see on these <laughs> tapes, just, who is that again? Oh yeah, now I remember. And uh, in, in, in my first 40 years, or just after the 40th birthday, uh, I used to go down to TBN, which is a, a Christian radio uh, organization, or TV organization down in uh, Southern California, in Santa Ana. And one of the times I was teaching a prophecy series. And I didn't have a smart board, so everything had to be written on a, on a whiteboard. And you look at that and you think, great guns. Yeah, that's really, that's what it was like. Oh, wow. Interesting. I mean, I think I'm looking at my son. Uh, I mean, when you see Rick preach, you see me preach. There's, there's a lot of similarities other than the hair and the wrinkles and all that kind of stuff. But as I'm looking back on that, uh, I found a tape, my very last message in Fresno, California. And that was what you would call the glory days because of the growth and, and everything else that was going on then. And what I was sharing with the people was what I learned during those 13 years. What I learned about myself and what I learned about the Lord. And one of the statements that I made is that I really learned to, because at that early stage of my life, I was so task-oriented, so detailed, so this had to come and then this and this and so linear in my thinking. It wasn't real creative, just very, very linear in my thinking. And I wasn't very people-oriented. I mean, I thought I was people-oriented, but the more I... Uh, look back, I realized, no, I wasn't really people-oriented. I was task-oriented. There are things I wanted to accomplish. There are goals I wanted to reach, and, and that's what I did. So as I'm up there preaching, I'm just telling the people that I've, in this process, I am learning to spend time with people. I'm learning to love people. I'm learning to pray for people. I'm learning to be much more people-focused. And so I'm just talking about some other things that I've learned over the years, and I was talking with Steve this morning, and I said, you know what, I didn't realize what was happening, is I was, after 13 years of ministry in that one church, I was leaving people who love me, going to a church where people would tolerate me for a year and a half. <laughs> and that was it. And I'm smiling, you know, and just saying all the things I've learned, and I'm sure the Lord has some more for me to learn in the future. <laughs> And the Lord was there with the back. Come on, come on. I got some neat things for you to learn here. Whop! <laughs> what a roll. And it was after that experience I wrote the book God's Waiting Room. And that's what I'm talking about here. You have this great experience of life. Many years of, of uh, you know, preaching and teaching and TV and and video ta uh, videotapes and audio tapes and writing books and all that stuff. And you think, man, if it was like that here, man, when I get over here, it's going to be even greater. Not exactly. <laughs> Everything that happened here was the exact opposite over there. And uh, so I look at Moses, and I'm thinking of those first 40 years, and here he is the prince, and he has a name recognition, and the wealth, and the education, all these things. Next thing you know, he's on the back desert. Yeah, smelling like sheep. No name recognition. It's often a, it's often a time when you don't know what you don't know about the realities of life. And as I was looking at that, that DVD I made and watching me preach my heart out, I thought, kid, you just don't know what's ahead of you. You just don't know. 
you are going into a hornet's nest and you are leaving people you love to go to people who will tolerate you for a period of time and then the hornets will begin to sting. Um, but I didn't know what I didn't know. And no one can tell you what you don't know because you'll go, oh yeah, 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 well, yeah that's there. Yeah, I, I'm different. I, I, I can handle that. That's why the second 40 years may have a lot of unexpected surprises, both good and bad. Since we don't live as long as they did, we should talk about the next 20 years of our lives, okay? We can understand that a little bit better. Moses' second 40 years, a shepherd. By this time, Moses was certain that the best years of his life were behind him. And we often think that our glory years are the best time of our lives. However, they often, that often is not the case. They may be fun and exciting, but they are often a preparation for our significant years. Please make a distinction. Now, some people can have glory in their significant years. That's not most of us. But some people can continue the, the glory and, and really have some great impact on people's lives. But like the Apostle Paul said, not many of you are wise. Check out your calling. Not many of you are wealthy. Not many of you are, have great name recognition. Not many of you this, this, and this, and this. But God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confuse the wise. And the weak things of this world. And the things that people would say don't even exist. So that he gets the glory. So in our glory years, we receive the glory. In our glory years, we're in control. In our glory years, we have it all together. In our glory years, it's all about me. In God's glory years, everything changes. And we go from our glory to significance. And that is a major step. But often to get to the significance, we have to go through some life change. We have to go into God's waiting room. We have to go to what I would call a desert experience where we become more isolated, unknown, and sometimes feel useless. I mean, I'm already sort of in that process moving from where, from this position to whatever that new position is going to be, whatever that new responsibility and opportunity is going to be. I mean, after being here for 13 years, I know people walk in and I can walk by them and they will have no idea who I am. But I accept that because I've been there before. And I believe it was a yeah, Halloween night when my wife and I walked in. My wife went up to the booth and one lady says, uh, are you new here? Well, it's not her fault. It's just that she didn't recognize my wife. She'd been... She had been helping out here. So all that what once was begins to change and that begins to fade away. And new realities come into play. And it's often a desert experience where you really feel isolated and you wonder, God, where are you in all this stuff? Don't you know what's happening? Don't you know how I feel? I once was this, I once had that. But now there's nothing over here. And God says, good, that's where you need to be. Because you are learning, it's not about you. It's about me. Now, theologically we know that. It's when experientially we learn that, that it becomes difficult for us. And it won't become 
we, we will not learn that by someone telling us that. Remember, you don't know what you don't know. To go from it's all about me to it's all about him, that can be a lifelong process because we need constant reminders. We might say that verbally, but then we operate as though it's still all about me. Moses, when that truth captures our heart and mind, the Lord's ready to use us and impact others with us. I mean, when I think of what I was like in those glory days, uh, I am such a different person. It's, it's like a, just a totally different person. But an enriched person, a wiser person, a person more at peace with himself, a person who doesn't have to prove himself to anybody. Because in a sense, I don't care what you think. <laughs> it's, it's what God thinks. It's, it's that God is the one I'm trying to please. And, and, and if you don't like it, hey, get over it. <laughs> that's, that's who I am becoming. And, and to be able to walk around with a, with a heart of peace and, and, uh, and a mind of peace. And to know that I'm, next week that I retire from, from this, these four walls. Uh, it's like, yeah, God, okay. Now what? And it's not, oh, now what? No, it's, hey, now what? And it's a, just a totally different attitude. It's like, man, this is exciting. I was telling my wife today at lunch, I said, you know, I, I feel today like I felt, you know, as I'm looking at these tapes, there are several times I, re, I, I, I left the church and went to another church, and I'm, I'm watching these farewell parties and things like that. And I'm thinking, hey, I'm there again. And, and it's exciting. And, and God's going to do some neat things. I don't know what exactly it looks like, but I'm ready for it. The downside is that Moses' confidence in himself had been shattered. So he was not ready to take on some great challenge. And it's usually when you are at the point of your life where your, your, your life feels shattered that... After a period of time of feeling shattered, or maybe broken in pieces, or maybe not quite sure what's the next step, that's often when God throws us a zinger and says, right, you're ready, come here. Do I have a plan for your life? And you look at it and you say, oh man, not that. <laughs> no, 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 you got the wrong person. I can just imagine Moses, when he sees, meets God in the burning bush, that the thought in his mind could very well have been, Lord, I'm 80. Why didn't you call me when I was somebody? When I was 40, when I was strong, when I was, had the wisdom and the culture and the language and, 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 and had all these, this, this wonderful network of people and, and I could get things done for you. Do you know why I say that? Because that's what the New Testament tells us about Moses. The New Testament tells us that Moses thought that the people recognized him as their deliverer at the age of 40. He was ready to deliver. That's why he kills the Egyptian. Now Moses' plan, his strategy was to Knock off one Egyptian at a time. <laughs> Eventually I'll get rid of these guys and, and we'll just go marching out of Egypt. Down yeah. yeah. <laughs> he thought his people understood. That's when he was 40 years of age. That's when he had the name recognition. He had the authority. He had the power. He had the glory. And he's saying, here I am. Here I am, people. And they respond by saying, you going to kill us like you killed that Egyptian? Yeah. Wow. The secret's out. 
They know I killed the Egyptian. I better get out of here. So he's spending 40 years on the back desert, taking care of stinky sheep, smelling like the sheep. No authority, no name recognition, self-image shattered, convinced it's too late now. God can never use me now. And God looks down and says, Moses, you low enough? You convinced you are a nobody? Yeah, Lord, I'm convinced I'm nobody. Good. Now I can make you somebody. As long as you and I think that we are somebody, and we just have so much to offer to the world, God says, well, spend a few more days, months, or years in my waiting room because I can't use you yet because you still think it's about you. That was Moses' problem. All of a sudden, he's out there, and he sees a bush that's burning. And he goes over to look. How come this bush isn't consumed? It keeps on burning. God gives Moses good news and bad news. Let's look at chapter 3. I love this good news. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him, Moses, Moses. Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place you are standing on is, is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So, I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians, to bring them up out of the land into a good and a spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. Ah, oh, good news. Listen to what God says. I have seen their misery. Friend, if you're going through misery, other people may not see it because you may be hiding it, but God sees your misery. I've heard them crying. If you shed tears, if you cried out to God, he says, I hear you. I am concerned. Boy, that's good news. Because you're concerned. <laughs> you're concerned. Now God says, I'm concerned. I'm concerned about your concerns. And I have come down to rescue them. Man, that's great news. And I'm sure Moses is thinking, wow, that is fantastic. That's the best news I've heard these 40 years. When are you going to do it, Lord? How are you going to do it? God, maybe you didn't know that, but I was ready 40 years ago. I wish you would have called on me. But pfft, now I can't do it. That's the good news. Now, here's the bad news. Verse 10, so, now go. What? Yeah, go. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> Man. Lord, you got the wrong person. Okay. Four years earlier, Moses would have said, wonderful, man, I've been waiting for you to show up. About time. Let's go get them. Let's get those Egyptians. But no, 40 years in the back desert. 40 years in God's waiting room. 40 years going from way up there to way down here. 
40 years of going from being somebody to becoming nobody. And it's usually until we get to that point that we are nobody that God can make us somebody. But as long as we are somebody, God has a very difficult time using us. As long as we are legends in our own minds, God says, I can't use you. So let's see what Moses runs into. He is still under the impression that it was all about him. And when God is leading you somewhere and you balk at it, it's because you still haven't learned. It's not about you. Therefore, he throws up four excuses, one cop out. That's why he's not qualified for the job. So let's look at these excuses. Who am I? Who are you? What if I fail? I'm not a good speaker. I really don't want to go. <laughs> so let's look at these very carefully. First, who am I? God's response, it doesn't matter who you are. It matters who I am. That's a very important lesson to learn. I don't care who you are. I'm nobody. Good. I can use a nobody. God says, I will be with you. This will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you've brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Okay. When you think, sense that God is leading you in a certain direction, and you keep wondering, man, who am I to do this? God is saying to you, don't worry about who you are, it's who I am. I will be with you. You know, there are those times we f think we have to get our act totally together, that we have to have all the answers before we can be used of God. And God says, no. If you are willing to go forward, if you're willing to move on from me, I can put my words in your mouth. I can give you a love that you don't have right now for those people over there. I can put wisdom into your mind. I can do all kinds of things with you, but I just need your availability. It's not about you. So no use shooting back at me, well, I'm nobody. I know that. <laughs> if you were somebody, I wouldn't use you. But the fact that you are convinced that you can't do it means the glory is not going to go to you. And we'll accomplish a lot together. I am with you. Here's a sign for you. You're going to bring the people right back here. Okay? Next question, who are you? <laughs> I love Moses. He says, I haven't passed Theology 101. <laughs> I don't even know your name. Here you're a God telling me to go somewhere down there to Egypt. So he says, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, well, What's his name? What shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what are you to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name by which I am to be remembered from generation to generation. It's the name Yahweh. I am that I am. It's the word Jehovah, the name Jehovah. This is the very name 
that Jesus picks up in John 8, 58. When the religious leaders are rebutting Jesus, because Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. He said, you're not even 50 years old. You're saying you are greater than our father Abraham. Yes, before Abraham was, I am. Very poor English, but very correct theology. Because he was claiming to be this Jehovah of the Old Testament. The I am appeared to Moses, and the I am was appearing to those religious leaders. And what Jesus was saying, remember Moses? The God that appeared to Moses? Guess what, gang? I'm the same God. Yeah, that's why they wanted to put him to death, because he was claiming to be God. I am the God of your fathers. This is my eternal name. This is that personal name. It's not Elohim. It's not El. The Bible says, in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. That is the general name for God. But what God is saying here, I am the personal God. I am your God. There's power in a name. There's relationship in a name. That's what I want you to call me, Yahweh. He says, I have seen what has happened to you. God notices our pain and difficulties. He also notices the causes and the solutions to our pain. I am here to deliver you, verse 17. I have promised to bring you up out of your misery in Egypt into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, etc., Moses was the source that God used to deliver the people, but it was God who must be credited with the deliverance, not Moses. Moses was the vessel. He was the vehicle that God was using. He says in Psalm 81, I removed the burden from their shoulders. Their hands were set free from the basket. In your distress you called and I rescued you. I answered you out of the thundercloud. So God is the one who is the deliverer. He is the Savior. Moses was the vehicle through which he worked. Now, at first it will seem like a failure, but in the end, Pharaoh will let you go. Notice verses 18 to 21. The elders of Israel will listen to you. Then you and the elders are to go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. Let us take a three-day journey into the desert to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. So I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform among them. After that, he will let you go. In other words, what God is saying is, Moses, I'm going to call you, I'm calling you to go down to Egypt, the place from which you fled. And I want you to go to the Pharaoh down there and tell him, I, let my people go. But Moses, be aware of the fact that he won't let you, your people go. In other words, you are going to fail on this mission at first. You will be ridiculed. You will look like a total failure. But after I show my glory and my power to the Egyptians, he will let your people go. Now, how would you like an assignment like that? First of all, it's sending him back to where there were death threats, <laughs> where they wanted to kill him, back into the hornet's nest. And then when he's back there, God already tells him ahead of time, you're going to fail. At least at first. And you're going to have to confront Pharaoh. And I'm going to perform all kinds of wonders and powers in front of Pharaoh, and eventually he will let your people go. You will leave Egypt with 
and abundance. Okay, it's we're past time. We'll look at the other excuses next week and hopefully tell you a little more about Moses before we close. I hate to teach like this. I feel like I'm Russian. But uh, I really want you to interact with Moses because the reason I love Moses so much is because I've been to the places Moses has been. I've been to the mountaintop, I've been to the valleys. I've been in the spotlight and I've been in the closet. And I'll tell you, when it finally gets through to you that it is not about you, it is about him, that's when you start getting into that land and in that area of your life of tremendous significance. Because that's when God is able to use you. And you will begin to see life change in other people because of you. Because of your faithfulness, because of your humility, because of you calling out to God, because of you recognizing that without Him you are nothing, but with Him you are everything that you can be. Thank you, God, that we can look back and identify with men because there are those times when we are in your waiting room. We are in that desert experience. We begin to question ourselves. We begin to question you. We wonder how in the world did I ever get to this situation? How do I get out of it? Where do I go from here? And then we look at the scriptures and we realize that you are with us the whole time. You are the God of graciousness. You are the God that provides for our needs. You are the God who picks us up out of the dust and moves us in the direction you want us to go. And then we begin to see you at work. And that's when true joy comes into our hearts and true peace into our minds. We honor you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.